Ladies and gentlemen, this is Confessions of the Idiots with Sam Peterson. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Confessions of the Idiots. Everybody wants to confess, but not everyone wants to hear them. Today, I'm joined by a guest who hasn't been on for a while, but you know them from Gruen Transfer, from the world of stand-up as a comedy legend. Now, from Question Everything and the 27 podcast he currently has, it is the great Will Anderson. Will, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Sam. I am glad that I could do the show. I appreciate it. I, Sam, for people who don't know, some behind the scenes, he yeah. kindly <laughs> asked back me. back that curtain. <laughs> he kindly asked me every, you know, month or so, and I yeah. say, check in again next month, and you'll check in again next month, and I'll yeah. be like, Check in again next month. And then when the email chain builds up to me seeing that I've said check in again next month for about five or six months, I'm like, I better just actually do this so we can start our yeah. check in again next month process. <laughs> I've got our process. I've got a I've got a standard thing in my diary that just says check in on Will. Yeah. Just check in. It's my check in so, once a month. Check in with Will. It's always nice to get the email, Sam. And I obviously do the show mostly so that I can keep getting the emails. <laughs> What a, what a newsletter. It's a very specific newsletter that comes out once a month just to you. Yeah, it's just from you. It's a little... You, you normally comment on something. It's quite nice. Yeah. You've normally listened yeah. to an episode of Philosophy or something. You'll say something yeah. nice about that. Then you'll uh, check in if I can do your podcast. I'll say, yeah. I'll hear from you again in one month from now. So. <laughs> That's a great way to sign out. I guess I'll hear from you in exactly a month again. <laughs> now, Will, over the over the last little bit, I mean, we spoke probably about a year mm -hmm. ago now. Uh, the the world the world has changed because of the pandemic, COVID dash uh, nineteen. Mm -hmm. How has your how has your world changed? I mean, I hear you talk about it on Willosophy with various guests talking about how their worlds have changed. But for you personally speaking, being a live touring stand up that does it all the time and is always always with a packed diary, you know, and emailing me once a month at, at the bare minimum. How, how do you, how, how has your world changed? And, and have, has, have you changed in the way that you operate? I mean, it's the true answer is substantially, of course, as in, yeah. I think everybody's world has changed substantially. And at the moment, we're all a bit nervous about how we talk about that. Because, yeah. you know, there was this uh, famous case on Twitter recently of a woman who complained. Her tweet was very tone deaf, but she was complaining about the extended Cindy lockdowns. And her complaint was that she was single and she was in her mid-30s and her time to have a baby was running out. And people sure. on the internet were, of course, very kind and considered in their responses to that, Sam, as they always are. Yeah. They yeah, yeah, understood yeah. from a purely empathetic point of view that she was one of many people who were... Oh, no, hang on, that's not what happened. <laughs> they crucified her for daring to express the idea that this global pandemic that had shut everybody inside for a year and a half had had yeah. some impact on her life. Of course, it's had impact on all of our lives. And I think yeah. if we... Um, you know, anyone who's been to therapy knows that it's not a very healthy way to just compartmentalize your own suffering because other people have been suffering worse. And I think that sure. we're going to have to deal with how do we talk about what we've personally lost while yep. we reconcile it with compared to the rest of the world, we're still probably doing okay. And so... sure. With that proviso, that's my ramble. That's my, uh, before I complain about... Will's on another rant. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying, I get it. I get I'm not the most fucked. I get I'm not the most worst off, but it's always a great way to lead into something. Right. A friend of mine said to me, I turned 29 in lockdown last year, and this year I've got my 30th in a month. And a friend of mine said, oh, 29, it's the best year of mm. your life. And I was like, wasn't for me. No. But I'm not going <laughs> to... Really? I'm not, not going to post about it. Really wasn't. No, I really ran out the shot clock on my 30s, <laughs> on my 20s. Just like, you know what, guys? We've got enough of a lead. We're just going to bounce it around in the backcourt for a year. <laughs> I did Contiki just in Brunswick. I mean... Just like walking around for, for a month. I imagine actually in Brunswick now there would be enough sort of pop-up tiki bars that you could do a version yeah. of Contiki just you walking really around the streets of Brunswick. And, you know, to replicate the Contiki experience, you are also likely to get some sort of terminal disease from <laughs> fraternising with people. So it's actually spot on. Cheap... Drink some yeah. cheap booze by yourself and just cry a little bit and you get the whole experience. <laughs> you get ripped off by someone in an alleyway. It's just perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah, what I would say is Bo Burnham managed to 
make one of the most iconic comedy specials of all time, you know, about yeah. him turning 30 in lockdown. So yeah. no pressure, but you've got a month. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was so funny talking to you as well. Like when you did the stand special and you were saying, you know, like just filming something as well, like how annoying it was to film a segment for, you know, for something. And, and, and I know a lot of comedians who are complaining about that. And then Bo Burnham comes out with that. You're like, all right, mate, we've all got stuff going on. Yeah, all right, mate. We that's all could fine. have been very productive. It's okay, <laughs> mate. We've all got a shit out the back of our mansion that we could go and pretend that we live in. <laughs> <laughs> one room. I live in one room and I've got a great lighting set up in that room. Hang on, but um, where's your wife? I oh, know, she's in the mansion. <laughs> Sorry, hang on. This is all a conceit. One of the most glorious conceits of all time, by the way. Of course. It's a brilliant yeah, special. We're not complaining, no. but, but not a criticism of that. But Will, for you, I know you were about to, after you finished the, the rant, when you went off your rocker for a bit, uh, then, then you were about to say how it has personally affected you. So how has it? Uh, so I quit my breakfast radio job um, uh, at the end of 2019 because I was sick of not touring. I'd had, you know, sort of a year where I just hadn't toured anywhere near as much as I had wanted to, but that was fine because I was like, you know what, in 2020, I'm just going to pretty much tour full time. I've got 10 weeks of television to do, but I've cleared out the rest of my schedule and I'm going to tour all over Australia to places I haven't been before. I had three shows in the mix. I was doing like We're Legal in some places. I was doing What You're Talking About, Will, my improv show in some places. And I was also doing, um, yeah, my kind of new stand-up show like in a whole bunch of places as well. And then, you know, it turns out the secret of comedy is absolutely timing. Because then I didn't have anything to do for ages, like for a really long time. And that was interesting in itself because normally I do have things in the schedule. So like for such a huge part of it to go away and then there to just be no immediate way to replace it, it was it was quite confronting. Because I've always yeah. thought of stand-up. I've always like, consi- you know this, Sam, I've considered myself to be a stand-up comedian by trade. And yeah. then all the other things I just do you know, to get people to come and see me do stand-up comedy. And I already, always have had this, like for 25 years, I've kind of had this self-confidence that I didn't really give a fuck about those other things. I was like, yeah, whatever. Like TV yeah. comes and goes, radio, blah, blah, blah. It's okay because I can always go back to my trade. Stand-up yeah. comedy. The one thing that's yeah. never going to go away <laughs> is gathering people in unventilated rooms and trying to get them to expel fluids from their mouth as often as possible at each other. <laughs> that will never be something the world has a problem with. What, what for you, like in, in terms of like going back for the, I know you went back for the Melbourne Comedy Festival, was it, was it, was there a massive difference in, in performing? Did you think, did you think getting back in front of a live crowd again, there was a, there was a difference that you kind of noticed with people? It's different from state to state. Yeah. So Adelaide, for example, cause I went to Adelaide first unexpectedly, yeah. Tom Ballard got caught in New Zealand under the COVID conditions and they... They rang me up. The most perfect way to do a festival, by the way. Normally, for the Adelaide Fringe Festival, they ask you in like July of the previous year, what's the name of your show for Adelaide Fringe next year? And you're like, I've barely fucking finished the show I'm doing right now. <laughs> Luckily, I have 50 will puns in a file yeah. <laughs> and I will flick through those and I will find the one that seems most appropriate and then I will send it through to the you. The less shit one as you're going down the list now. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. I mean, sometimes I, I try to keep a couple of good ones up my sleeve. Because yeah. I have always had that forward thinking principle of like, if I've had a couple of good ones in a row, I could probably roll out a shit one so I can save a good one for five years from now when I really need. <laughs> you need to win the audience back <laughs> exactly. with your puns. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that's what normally happens. Instead, like I got this call from the Adelaide Fringe like a week out just saying we've got five nights next week that we you know, it'd be great for us if someone could come and do some shows. So I did four yeah. nights of were legal, which was great because it was a good way to get back into performing because it's a self-contained story. It doesn't really need to be affected by the time. So I can just get up there and tell that story. Yeah. And then I did my improv show, What You're Talking About, Will. And in Adelaide, it was so funny because it, for them, it was almost like COVID didn't happen. Not just because there hadn't been a lot of cases there, but because... Their major arts event, the Adelaide Fringe, like it got announced uh, in 2020. I think it was on the Friday night of the last weekend they announced that they were cancelling the Melbourne Comedy Festival. But yeah. they still did the, the rest of the weekend of the Adelaide Fringe. So they got their thing. 
If anyone knows what happens in South Australia, they have the Adelaide yeah. Fringe, they have the Adelaide Festival, they have WOMAD, WOMAD they have yeah. like all these events, like their motor race, like the horse, Adelaide Cup, the horse race, all these things all happen in like their mad march, they call it, right? <laughs> and then they just basically watch footy until yeah. it's March again. That's what they, they do. They wait for you guys to come back who fucked off and then you come back. And we did. That's how it happens. So for yeah. them, nothing really happened. We weren't going to be there all year anyway. And then yeah. we came back. So when you went out on stage in Adelaide, it just had that vibe of people were very happy to be out and about, but yeah. it didn't feel that unusual. But coming to Melbourne, it was a really different experience because, I mean, I remember on about the third night, someone sneezed and everyone freaked out. <laughs> Like it was the battle best, station, the best heckle ever in a comedy show is just during COVID times, just let out a big sneeze. Not one person in 600 people was saying, Bless you, they were all like, Fuck you. It was this super spreader in the middle of this show. And there was a real, for a lot of Melbourne people in particular, because they went through that huge lockdown, it was the first night that they had, they were out doing something they'd just been told for six months they weren't allowed to do. So for the yeah. first 10 minutes of the show, you, there was really a sense in the room of not, you know, excitement that we're here, but more nervousness. Is this an okay thing that we should be doing? Yeah. And I guess in retrospect, those nerves were really accurate because it's turned out it isn't a thing that we are able to do still in 2020. So we had this little brief window where it felt like the world was – you know, healing quicker than it turns out. Spoiler alert, it was yeah. not. <laughs> we were all like, it's we're over. We can laugh yeah. her again. Yeah, Ron Howard voiceover. It was not over. They could not laugh again. <laughs> and we'll probably never laugh again. But for you now, like going back into that world and like being, you know, with, with Melbourne Comedy Festival, did you... Did you realise that things had changed in a big way audience-wise? Was there, obviously, they're, you know, a little bit more sceptical and everything about going out and being around people. But do you think that, that comedy and the way you delivered things changed at all? I, Was there a different awareness Still to be confirmed. Good question, Sam. Yeah. But still <laughs> to be confirmed. Because yeah. I was doing Well Legal, that's a, a show that, you know, is of a time and a place anyway. Um. With the improv shows, they're always in the moment. So it's really easy to be just, you know, with COVID, like the idea of getting material, or getting your head around material or what your attitude on, is on this global event that is pretty much, you know, dwarfed out everything else in comparison. Yeah. You like you can't talk about other current affairs at the moment because people are like, why are you talking about that and not the big C in the room, right? Yeah, yeah, And yeah, yeah. I think that... But when you're talking about COVID, from state to state, it's been a different experience. From country to country, it's been a different experience. From person to person, it's been a different experience. And that experience can change from week to week, depending on what your personal circumstances are. And so yeah. it's really challenging to work out how to talk about things and what it is that you want to talk about. And I'm in the, the period of time now where I'm like, hopefully looking at doing a brand new show in in 2022 i haven't done a new show since 2019 normally i do a new show every single year and so suddenly it's like there's a lot of weight on that of like yeah. it should be about something it should be really yeah. good i hope this show is going to really solve that COVID. better be fucking good <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If this if this joke doesn't cure a global pandemic then i have failed as a comedic artist <laughs> People are but like, I, I, remember when you used to just complain about kids ordering baby chinos? We like that, yeah. Will. <laughs> yeah, they do all have iPads now. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's um, there was something interesting. I, I so it's I haven't done stand up in in three three years. I had a as a, the the listeners know, I had a blackout on stage. I stopped doing stand up for that reason, and. It was amazing to go to the comedy festival this year. I saw about twenty four shows, and you know, you're not you're not you know a, a participant in the festival anymore, and you go along. And it was so nice this year, just for me personally, to see people that I really like doing really well. Like it was a really nice thing to see local people that you know I've sort of come through the ranks with doing really well and it was exciting to see it but there was still this sense every time you went near someone at the bar someone would look at you and stare at you until you went away like conversations would stop <laughs> kind of like when a waiter walks up to the table and everyone just stops talking what they're talking about it was anytime anyone walked up to anyone there would be like a look 
And because you're doing, you know, you're doing a, a big theatre and everything, there was that kind of people were very careful. Like the line was different, like just walking in. So just as an audience member, that was very different, you know, and it was a, it was a noticeable change in, in that way as well. I mean, there's so many tricks of, and look, I mean, as my audience gets older, they complain more about the volume that I play my hip hop music before my show. But <laughs> it there's a reason for that. Like I think about those things and part of the reason that I, use hip hop before my shows is because like it gets people used to somebody speaking quite quickly a lot of the time, which is something that I'm going to do. I normally like to have it set at a level where people have to talk a little bit louder than they would normally talk because it gets them used to like using their outdoor voices and their outdoor noises. Like, you know, so there's, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But this year the music felt way too loud because people were already coming in so quiet that suddenly the music in the room at some stage i actually said to them i said we're gonna have to turn the house music down (laughs) it's too much it it frightens people i feel like we i feel like dr dre is frightening some older people (laughs) that have just played their own music at their own volume for a whole year (laughs) and now they don't have a choice in the volume of the music (laughs) right yeah even that (laughs) yeah even just being in a public space and being forced to listen to other people's idea of what good music is was really confronting for some people How, how did you feel about having time off for the first time? How did you feel about actually not working, like not getting up? I mean, I, I imagine you're an early riser anyway, but the thing that is kind of known about you is that you get up every day and you write or you work on something every single day. So <clears throat> for the first time, you being unable to do that just because, you know, well, not unable, but you're not working on something every single day. Did you relax into it? Are you a good relaxer now? Well, some might argue that you mentioned that I have a new TV show and I haven't had a new TV show in 13 years. Yeah. Some might put the two together and go, I spent some of my time in lockdown <laughs> coming up with a new <laughs> TV, a TV show. show. <laughs> so, Great. Um, and yeah, I, I lent into the podcast more. I tried. I did try to... Um, you know, enjoy some of the space I had and in, and yeah. think about things more and like, you know, and actually switch off. But no, I was still doing four or five podcasts a week and I <laughs> yeah. was, you know, I developed this new TV show which took, you know, a few months to, to do. And yeah, I spent my time working. I just worked on some things that I could work on from home. Yeah. I sure. like that. I think that I like that. Uh, so I, I would say that, you know, switching from you know, my work always being away from home to switching a whole bunch of my work to something that I could actually just do from home and then get back into regular life. I liked yeah. that. So I think I would try to incorporate more of that, you know, into my regular life that I can still The be, idea of clocking off? Well, or the idea of bringing my work home so that I'm never away from it. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your perspective, I guess, when you look at that one. Um, it... I think it's important that, I mean, I hope that the arts gets its swagger back. You know, the arts has been decimated and the comedic arts, you know, we know where we are on the, you know, the totem pole of, you know, respect that arts get in this country. But, you know, we are a huge commercial art, you know, comedy. It it contributes to, you know, media and entertainment at almost every level. And the industry itself is a big industry and it's good for tourism and there's, you know, a myriad of people who have jobs off the comedic arts as an industry, but they've been woefully supported by the government and other than small minorities, the general public. Like, I mean, there's been incredibly loyal minorities of people who follow podcasts or YouTube or whatever who have kept those creators alive during this time. But in the broader sense of the support, there has also been a whole bunch of people who've had more things to worry about than supporting artists during this time yeah, but <laughs> sure. a lot of them have been relying on that art it might might be your podcast that gets them through the week it might be somebody's youtube clip or something that they've made online or you know some piece of writing that they've done you know big television shows movies this is what has got a lot of people through this time i hope that as the arts we remember how important we've been and how little anyone else gives a fuck about us other than ourselves. And we stop listening to what the rest of society says about what we do. And we just appreciate that, like, it is a good thing that we do. And it does not need external validation in that way. But then 
what we need to do is look after each other. We need yeah. to have a better way of, I always think it's hilarious. One of the things I like to do is try to like, you know, support other people's work. You know, like if somebody's made some funny clip or whatever, the least I can do is retweet it on Twitter. It's not a lot of effort, right? And I have nearly half a million followers on Twitter. Now, I know that doesn't mean that all those people see that, but if I retweeted it and Tom Gleason retweets it and Hannah retweets it and Husey retweets it, that's better than you going on the morning show or Sunrise or like, you know, on some other sort of show to plug your tour. So there's all these young comedians, for example, you think, how can we help? Like one of the most basic ways you can help is just use your audience. And if we consistently did that, like if every time, you know, Gabby Bolt, you know, put out a new song, like Hannah retweeted it and I retweeted it and Julia Zemiro retweeted it, then that's better than her going on a television show and doing that song. So yeah. I sometimes, we, we look for all this external power, this external validation, this industry. We so often change what we do as artists or comedians to fit into the broader society. They say, yes, you can come and do your comedy here on commercial radio, but you've got to do it this specific way and you can't say all the things that you want to say. And we do it because we think, oh, well, that's reach. That's how we get to audiences. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Like we already mm. have our audiences. If we just use them for our, anyway, whatever, I'm ranting again. No, I have no, been no, no. That's, that's, in lockdown that's, that's by myself a lot, Sam, and I've started <laughs> ranting about things. Okay, one more rant. And- I know anytime you, you reply to one of my emails with yes, I know that you're ready to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a year's worth of thoughts. I got, and here I they got him come. in a weak point. <laughs> um, can I just say, there was one thing Absolutely. that you mentioned that I, this is one of my absolute current day rant topics, which is <laughs> you talked about all your you know friends, colleagues, people that you've supported, had on the podcast and stuff who did the Melbourne Comedy Festival this year and finally got the opportunity. Like if you look at, I mean, just on a really basic level, if you went through all the awards at the Melbourne Comedy Festival this year, and awards are not the only way to look at it, but just as a starting point for this example, the nominees for the best show were almost exclusively a bunch of comedians, none of whom are household names, but are all comedy industry household names. All yeah. people that we all have known have been great for years, but yeah. finally got the opportunity without the festival bringing out 20 international acts. Because for people who don't know, the Melbourne Comedy Festival, and I'm not, I'm not picking fights with anyone, but... Um, <laughs> are you listening, Susan? <laughs> The Mel- you directly go on one person. The Melbourne Comedy Festival brings out international acts and they pay for them to come out and they give them good venues and they put them on the gala and stuff because they have a financial interest. And yeah. in the past, there was a real argument for the Australian scene wasn't as diverse as the world scene. Like maybe it's great for young women comedians to see a huge UK woman comedian come out and, you know, that's great for the industry or a differently yeah. abled comedian or someone who wasn't being represented on the scene. I understand how I get that in the past. And, yeah. you know, the comedy festival. But this is Australia's festival. Like when, when Australian acts go to Edinburgh, there isn't someone from the Edinburgh Festival like playing for the, paying for their plane ticket and putting them up in a nice hotel and giving them a good yeah. slot at a venue. It doesn't work like that. It is unfair. And mm. so what happens is that your Luke Heggies of the world or your Michelle Braziers of the world or these sort of acts – they get a worse time slot and they get a worse venue because the best time slot and the best venue are given to these international acts. Yeah. I'm not saying, you know, close the borders. I'm not saying build a wall around Melbourne during comedy festival time (laughs) and don't let the internationals in. (laughs) Daniel Sloss was in Australia. He won the People's Choice Award, which is for the most tickets sold in the festival. He came out uh, because a promoter was like, he has an audience here. I'll pay for him, an independent promoter. I'll pay for him to come out. He tours... That is the yep. market. That's how it works. Absolutely fine with that. Internationals should come out all the time. In fact, I think the festival could take some of the money they're spending on a select group of internationals and use it to better help and facilitate independent internationals who want to come out. If you're a comedian in Canada or if you're a comedian in Germany, but you need help with the visa process or how to get like a room, great. Let's put some of that money into helping smaller independent people but let's not import people to fight against our own industry. And yeah. the reason I want to say this is because it doesn't affect me. 
It's not about comedians at my level. I'm still going to sell the exact same amount of tickets regardless. It is about that next level of comedians down who suddenly had the chance to be in a 150 seat or 200 seat or 300 seat room, who suddenly had the chance for people to see them in the first week for the critics, you know, like the critics to come out and see them in the first week. They got that slot at the gala. I mean, Geraldine Hickey, who's been a great comedian for a very long time, but this year she got on that gala I mean, you know, she probably would have anyway, but she got on that gala. She did that gala spot, which was just fucking one of the best gala spots I've seen in the history of gala spots. <laughs> yeah. And then she rolls into the festival, goes from like a 200-seat venue to a 1,000-seat venue by the end of it and wins the award. Yeah. Now, that might have happened regardless, but stories like that will happen more often if we don't import artificial com- competitors to compete against the emerging comedians in Australia. So, yeah. okay, rant over. <laughs> <laughs> I like it how you always talk like you're in a walkie-talkie. <laughs> like, over. Rant over. <laughs> no, but I think that's fascinating, and especially, you know, I, I know that you are really supportive of comedians and especially upcoming comedians as well. And, and to see that as well during this time was really interesting for the first time ever. We didn't have these international people like the, you know, I remember when they brought out Joan Rivers and people like that, who you go, you know, they don't need this audience. You know, this audience is, you know, it should be for wonderful Melbourne people. And that's not saying they came here and took our jobs, but it is really interesting. It's actually exactly what I'm saying. But, um, but it is really interesting to, to see it like Michelle Wolf come over or people like that, that you just like, yeah, it is, it is really exciting for once to see people that I really like, who I know really well, having an audience that wouldn't be there otherwise. And I think it is a really, I think it's a fascinating way to look at it. And you know, the other thing is like, I'm not even saying let's not import anyone. I'm just yeah. saying let's be selective about who we import. Like instead yeah, of it being yeah. 20 or 25, maybe it is five, maybe it yeah. is 10. And there are still some people that will add that flavor to the festival, but then open it up. Like if yeah. Mark Watson, like, I mean, I love Mark Watson, but if Mark Watson wants to come back, Mark Watson can come back. Mark Watson's got yeah. an audience here. He'd be able to yeah. find a way to come back to the festival. And David O'Doherty and you know people like that who have just been coming here for so long. Of course they're going to come back. Yeah, of course. Yeah, when they actually can. Yeah, absolutely. When you physically can. <laughs> but, but because you have been busy working on Question Everything, Will, was that something during the time that you were getting fed up at the fake news world, the world of fake news? What? When did that idea for you come about well when you started working funnily, on that? funnily enough sam it came about in the year 2016 i'm not sure what happened in the year 2016 that really <laughs> made me think that something happened <laughs> something happened something happened worldwide that made me think that perhaps we weren't uh getting the best information or believing the best information and we won't go into it but something happened but the the big tea in the room was that i i thought it was almost impossible to do a show like the show that i imagined during the time of like, you know, him being the American president because he just dwarfed like completely all other coverage of like, you know, what was going on. You know, it really was, if you were talking about like, and the show is about disinformation and misinformation and, you know, fake news, if you want to put it that way, although that term is a term that we, we don't really use that much on the show. But um, when it came to that, you saw all those American shows, those American news shows, they just became so obsessed with every single thing that he would say. And clearly it wasn't helping. It wasn't yeah. stopping him from being successful or being able to spread this misinformation. And so it it's felt... More of a platform for him, if anything. Right. So it's such a difficult area. So basically there was a couple of things that came together. The global pandemic, um, I really wanted to do a show that could give some young... I was watching Dan Ellick's show, At Home Alone Together, and it was a whole bunch of, you know, kind of newer and emerging Australian comedians who'd all been, you know, making sketches in their own homes. And it it was great. It was so many funny people, so many talented people, but didn't rate amazingly. And I think we have a real problem in... Oh, shit, I'm about to rant again. But we have a real (laughs) problem in this country and probably in society in general where we we'll look at um, the success of a television program based on overnight ratings. Now, overnight sure. ratings are just a survey of like 2,000 people and they extrapolate that out to say, you know, a million people watched this show last night. And I can say that yeah. because under that system, I've had the number one rating show at the ABC for like 12 years. So yeah. like 
again, I think when you're the person who's the beneficiary of like the system, you have to also be the one who's most critical of the system. It is a very sure. inaccurate system for measuring the success of a television show. It is purely a statistical guess, you know? So yeah. um, we look at a show like At Home Alone Together and maybe it has 350,000, 400,000 people watch it. And in television terms, that seemed to be a bit of a failure, right? But that show, like... People will look back on that show and the people who can contribute to that show and they will grow in the industry and they'll make their own shows in the same way as the people who did Hungry Beast have all gone on to make their own shows and yeah, do their own projects. The show itself yeah. wasn't super successful at the time, but in retrospect, you'll look at it and go, that'll be one of the most iconic successful shows in Australian history. Tonightly will and be as well. And The Feed and yeah, feed. all of those shows. Yeah. yeah, all these shows that really people aren't watching a lot at the moment, but the influence they will have on the future direction of... You know, so Jan Fran, who's on my show, she came from the feed, you know, through yeah. the feed. Um, you know, you look at Mark Humphreys, you look at what, you know, Jenna and Vic are doing there at the moment, Mark and, you know, Alex Lee. And like, I mean, it's an incredible yeah. team. Ben Jenkins, all those guys, they're all going to be major, you know, creative forces in the Australian entertainment industry for generations. And so yeah. I was talking to Dan Illich on my uh, philosophy podcast and he was just talking about the idea that he's always pitching shows with these people but you know you kind of get the well unless you're will anderson you're not going to get this show up and i was like well hang on i'm will anderson so <laughs> great moment to realize <laughs> what, what i'm he what i'm hearing here is <laughs> what if i pitched a show <laughs> with some of these new people on it do you think because i am by your will logic <laughs> So I went into the meeting and I said, I've got two things. I've got an idea for a show for younger Australian comedians and I've got the fact that I am Will Anderson and I believe that is all you need. I am Will Anderson from the title of the podcast. <laughs> so I wanted to make a show that was around, you know, asking questions about the information that we were getting and um, giving an opportunity for younger performers to be on a panel show because when I first started out, one of the greatest things that happened in my career was I got to go on Good News Week. Still the most right. fun I've ever had on television because it yeah. was all fun, no responsibility. Once you sit in the middle chair, television isn't that fun anymore because you're the host, you're the ringmaster, you're the one who has the, you know, you're the party pooper. Everyone else can yeah, have fun yeah, yeah. and eventually <laughs> you have to move it on because there's another yeah. segment, you know. Whereas that newbie chair on good news week and um, can you imagine like i'm sitting there like you know and paul mcdermott's there this guy that i grew up watching the other doug anthony all stars on the big yeah. gig in country victoria you know and uh, mikey robbins is there like you know like a dude i used to love watching seeing like you know like you know fiona lachlan and you and Husey and all these people that you know that we you know in country victoria it was so exciting to see them like i was the person that saw thaw the uh that thought that the gala was an hour and a half every year. Right. You know, like, you know, that, that sort of, um, I was, I've had a conversation the other day, Will, um, that one time my friend was telling me, he reminded me of this yesterday. He was like um, saying that during the comedy festival, when we came up to Melbourne and we went to go and see you and um, Fiona Lachlan and Judith Lucy, and we were so excited. And my friend told me that he saw Judith Lucy walk down the steps of the town hall. And I did not believe him. I went, I don't think so. I don't think Judith Lucy would have walked down. You didn't see Judith Lucy. That's impossible. And I told Judith that over dinner one night and she goes, what did you think I did? Uh, Fucking floated. Right. But I guess like, that's what you imagine, right? <laughs> that's what I imagine. It's a disappointing reality are. when you're like, she snuck out of the toilet, which is actually the yeah. change room for the backstage <laughs> yeah. of the gala and then slid she down had the to stairs. Wait. <laughs> she had to wait in a meter when she could hear the audience coming in. Yeah. That's the actual reality of the wonderful world of showbiz. But for you sitting there with people like Mikey Robbins and people on good news week for the first time just looking out at these people and then you know the show's set up so that you just have to be funny a few times and you look great and so yep. i was so my thought was could i create something that served a few masters something that would give people they'd be able to sit down and watch and go away hopefully with a few things that they thought were true that aren't true anymore um or things that they might have just thought if they weren't paying that much attention to the news 
uh, you know, I joked about it, but I said, it's a bit of, have you really been paying attention? Not what you think the news story is, but what the news story actually was or why it was misreported yeah. like that way or what that statistic is that everybody's talking about that might not actually be a true statistic. Where did that come yeah. from? How did that get shared around? And so that was the idea of the show. And then the idea, you know, more than that was to create something where newer comedians could come on and have a space where they could hopefully be funny and, you know, show off, you know, have an opportunity where all the pressure wasn't on them. You know, they didn't yeah. have to carry the whole thing. They just had to be part of a bigger team where they could, you know, be funny. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that is what we are working on. Although, you know, making it in a lockdown without an audience. Like <laughs> I, I had these big dreams because back then, like a year ago, basically, yeah. when I sold this idea, my whole big dream was, oh, yeah, we'll be fine by then. Like we'll have, you know, full houses back at the ABC, big audience. Yeah. This will be so much fun. You know, this big yeah. party, comedians from all over Australia. How cool. And then it's like, <laughs> which particular local government area of Sydney do you live in, guest? <laughs> <laughs> Not just uh, we, we can't be in your guests bubble. from this city, but particular yeah. LGAs. So what's your LGA? <laughs> Something you never thought you would ask in your whole life. How will you be getting there? Yeah. How are you getting there? Who yeah. do you live with? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Anyone in the construction industry or say home delivery We'd love that to I need to know about? <laughs> but, so question everything is coming out really soon. So it's it's is it... Next, not this week, but next week. Well, dep- this podcast is coming out this Wednesday. Okay, so yes, it'll be in fact one one week. So great. So yeah. August the eighteenth, eight thirty. That's so exciting. ABC I for you. And then you're straight into Gruen after that. Yeah, so we do eight <laughs> weeks of uh, eight weeks of question everything, and then ten weeks of Gruen to finish. Oh, Will doesn't like working. He's he's really relaxed <laughs> over the last year. <laughs> well, it was not my ideal timing, but that was the slot they had. So <laughs> That's so great. No, that's so exciting. But Will, this com- this podcast is all about the wonderful yes. world of online confessions and I have sort of forgotten to bring those points up. Sometimes when I have a guest on that I really like and it happens every single time I had when I had Ross Noble on, I don't think we even did one confession, you know, and I sometimes do have to remember that it is about online confessions. No, I, I want to rant about some other people, not about myself. Yeah, great. Sam. <laughs> and so people always feel a little bit better about themselves when they hear some awful confessions about other people. So I've got the first confession that comes from Jack. Jack confesses. My friend Georgie Boy and I were out at a pub a little while ago. Sometimes we go with the lads, but some of the time it's just us. So, standard situation that we can understand. He doesn't need to go into all of that detail, but we kind of get where he's going. I mean, it's probably over-clarified, to be honest. <laughs> it really is. Like yeah. something I probably would have assumed regardless if he hadn't yeah. pointed out anything. Yeah. Sometimes we go with more people. Sometimes we don't. You're like, great. Okay. Move on. So like, so like someone going to the pub. You did not need yeah. to clarify. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm a pretty good wingman for Georgie Boy. And this was no different. Okay. So just so you know, Willie does call him Georgie Boy through the whole thing. I don't know if it's needed, but I kind of like it. Not Boy George. Very different. He had been chatting to this bird at work, Carla, and he was very interested. Mm-hmm. Carla had told him that a few of the girls were heading out that night and they were going to be at the pub. And excuse the French, that pub is fucking lit at the best of times. Okay. F- firstly, not French. Absolutely <laughs> not French. Absolutely. I've been to France, never heard somebody say anything was fucking lit. Fucking lit. <laughs> they rarely say that. I, I mean, rarely, I would say not at all. Like even, <laughs> I went into several lamp shots when I was in Paris. Not one of them. Even in lamp shots. No, nobody. <laughs> no one. Just using, to catch them out. You've done a lot of research over there, Will. <laughs> I was pretty excited to be out with Georgie Boy and told him that I'll go above and beyond to help him get lucky. I mean, so we both above turned and the beyond, charm up to 11. Off again, too much. <laughs> this, guy, this guy is immediately too much. Like if I'm going yeah. out with someone as my wingman and yeah. they say, you know what, I will go above <laughs> and beyond to be your wingman tonight and you'd be like, you're in love with me. <laughs> Are you saying that we should be together? You need to together? back right off. You are definitely in love with me. We need to invite more people to the pub, George. Sorry, boy. Goose, but I am going to need to dump you in the ocean, my friend, because this is... I think you just need to do the bare minimum as wingman. I think that's all you need to do. Your role is defined. You shouldn't be doing that as a wingman. 
So we're at the table with the girls and I'm chatting about makeup and stuff and trying to bring all the girls in. That's what girls love. Makeup and stuff. Makeup and stuff. Bra- I love makeup and stuff. My two big topics of conversation with women, bras and things <laughs> and makeup and stuff. <laughs> Bras and things. I hope you do say and things every single time. Well, well, because of the international branding change. But people might not know this, but there was a shop called Bras and Things, which I think... Yeah. I don't know if it was international, actually. It may have only been in Australia. Maybe internationally they like their bras sold separately to other things. But in <laughs> Australia, things. bras and things, makeup and stuff. It's like Bed Bath and Beyond. Yeah. <laughs> bras and Beyond. Well, this guy was more a bed, bath, and uh, beyond, above, above beyond. <laughs> he certainly was. <laughs> Carla makes eyes at me and we can't stop looking at each other. Oh. So do you know where this is going to go at the moment? Will you obviously know that there's going to be something else, well, something else happening in this confession. I mean, uh, here's the problem at the moment. Like his mate, Georgie boy, he's got eyes <laughs> for Carla. He does. <laughs> and then old mates down at the table talking about makeup and stuff. And Carla's like, hang on, I like, I like makeup. Hold the I, phone. I like makeup and stuff. And I like someone who will be go above and beyond for somebody. And suddenly I'm, I'm looking over here. <laughs> he really does understand women, doesn't he? Yeah. He really gets it. Makeup and stuff. After a bit, Georgie boy pulls me aside and says that Carla has a boyfriend. Uh. She'd never told him before, but wasn't into it. We go to leave and I give Georgie boy a lift home. But then I go back. I go back to the bar and see Carla. She loves that I've come back. And, well, that night we fuck. So he doesn't, he doesn't excuse the French there, Will. He doesn't go into fucking lit or anything. But he just says, that night we fuck. She tells me she just made up that she was seeing someone because she didn't want to see Georgie boy. But I feel so rotten about it. As soon as I came home, I knew that I'd messed up. So he, on the drive home, he realised. Well, he was say, fine on the drive home. I'm pretty sure that sentence would have been more accurate if it did not have home in it. Yeah. As soon, yeah, just he just messed up. You should know that instantly. You shouldn't go on the drive home. He goes, hold on. I don't think I should have done that. The fact that I dogged my friend and went back to the bar. It's only now occurred to me that this is not going, <laughs> this is not the dictionary definition of above and beyond. For a wingman. <laughs> As All the French might thoughts... say, this is not fucking lit. <laughs> all my friends were clear. All my thoughts were clear. He said friends, but I think it's all my thoughts were clear. And I feel like I need to tell him, mm. even though it will definitely crush him. Carla told me she wouldn't say anything, but I probably need to put my big boy pants on. Okay. Well, I, firstly, if he's driving home without having already put his big boy pants back on, <laughs> that's a problem. Firstly, that, you're half That naked, should be a lesson for everybody. You're on the way home. You've realised that you've... I, I mean, how devo could his mate be? His mate's yeah. a player. This is yeah. what I've already heard from this. Like, they're always down the pub. He's a great yeah. wingman. He's yeah. like been there for Georgie boy constantly. Georgie boy's got his like eye on Carla. Like, you know, she does not want to say, hey there, Georgie boy. She's like, no, thank you. I like your friend. <laughs> oh, mate over here. Talking about makeup and stuff. You know what I like to do? Wake up, put on a little bit of makeup. And this guy <laughs> seems to get me. So <laughs> um, I think th- th- he's overstating how devastated Georgie boy has the rights and responsibility <laughs> to be. I think sure. surely, you know, this, you know, this guy deserves, you know, if, if Carla's into him... Yeah. And he's into Carla. No big deal, man. Like, yeah. it's not like Georgie Boy and Carla had a thing. Georgie Boy just, like, was interested. Carla wasn't interested. Carla's yeah. interested no in one- you. This is not, a, this is no problem. No. And no one has dibs on anyone else. It's not like when you're in primary school and dibs something so your friend can't, you yeah. know, can't get a snack or something. It's like, hey, like, Carla just likes the French, but she, you know, she's obviously worried about hurting our good friend Georgie Boy as well. But but Jack, you know, they work together. If Jack starts seeing Carla, it's no big deal. Do you think he can just come clean, Will, and say, I, I went back that night and spoke about makeup and stuff and then we um, got fucking lit? I, yeah, I would say Georgie Boy. Georgie Boy, listen. Excuse the French. <laughs> and Georgie <laughs> will know where it's going. He gets yeah. it. He gets he it. He knows you. It. Yeah. So there's no, there's no way that you can't come clean to that because like just keeping it bottled up, that would be an awful thing just to hold on to, to feel guilty about something that you probably shouldn't feel guilty about in the first place. No, 
No, just tell your friend. It's fine. And yeah. If he doesn't understand, that's on Georgie Boy. That's on Georgie Boy. <laughs> the whole thing's on Georgie Boy, to be honest. I think Georgie Boy's got a little bit of work to do on himself. I, I think that. Yeah, I agree. Like, you know, yeah. I want to talk to Georgie Boy now. You guys are fine. <laughs> <laughs> Give me those big boy Georgie pants boy. and I'm taking them around to Georgie Boy's house. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Confessions of the Idiots with Sam Peterson. Idiots. It's me, Sammy P, interrupting the podcast right now to say, hey, maybe you want to support this very podcast and help it keep going. A great way to do that is through the Patreon page, where for as little as one US dollar a month, you can rest assured knowing that every Sunday a new episode will be coming out. So patreon.com forward slash confessions of the idiots to say thank you for that. I will give you a shout out on this very podcast. On this one, I can't do shout outs on other people's podcasts. If you like another one more, I'm so sorry. I do not have do not have the authority to go and give you shout outs on other podcasts. That's just not possible. But I can give you a shout out on this one. You will get an extra bonus episode a month. And like this one with Will Anderson, I want to give people extra episodes whenever I can. But on the Patreon page, you'll get a bonus episode per month with one of your favorite guests. And basically, supporting the Patreon page helps the podcast keep going. It helps pay for the studio time. It helps pay for the artwork by Redown. And it basically pays for the host site that this podcast is hosted on. So if you want to do that, patreon.com forward slash confessions of the idiots. There are some very funny bonus episodes up there at the moment. Mark Humphreys, Jess Perkins. There are so many, so many funny episodes up there right now. Plus the live, the only ever live episode of Confessions of the Idiots, the third birthday party spectacular is up there on the Patreon page. Here's a little clip right now so you can get you can get a hint of what it is. Here's the man I've chosen to have an affair with. Nice. The affair started, like many do, over a few Chiantis. What? Mm. <laughs> And some fire beans. Wait, I'm but what the fuck is that? A Chianti is a uh, red wine. Yeah. Is that is that uh, yeah. yep. Goes yep. best with oh, liver and fava beans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Over. Okay, so all love, uh, of course, Sorry. affairs. The story usually, called for it. <laughs> if you usually see someone having an affair, they've started with a few Chiantis. That mm. just goes without saying. I was there alone, but being noticed by this man, I told him I had a husband. He told me he had a wife, and we both laughed like drains. Oh, I hate when that happens. Like a drain. That is so much that fun. That's a drain laugh. That's a drain laugh. <laughs> and he's retired from acting. It doesn't make sense. He could play a drain. If you've got a drain cartoon coming up, Dave would be happy to be I'll involved. I'll the new it. Space Jam. I'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. Dave I'll do drains. it. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll drain Lawson. Am I right? <laughs> We're having a good what time. What did you say? Drain Lawson? I thought you said I'll drain Lawson. I was like, oh, Sammy P. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Come on, mate. So blow. I know I'm your co-host, but don't do this. Don't drag me into this. <laughs> Nothing more attractive than a man who can laugh. Or drain. <laughs> we made love that night and continued this affair, both deciding to meet at the same location on the same night. I told my husband I had a book club I simply could not get out of. <laughs> yeah. Nerd. Nerd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told my husband I had a book club. Oh, I'm just going to yeah, read that again. Did. Yeah, yeah, we did that. <laughs> he doesn't pay me enough attention to even know that I never read and I hate the sight of a book. <laughs> oh. We can tell, babe. Yeah. Yeah. Get that away. So the Patreon page is a great way to support this podcast. But hey, maybe you're not in a position to do that. Another great way is by leaving a review on whatever app you're on. Do that right now. It always helps get the podcast out there to so many, so many people. It's how the algorithms work. So please do leave a review right now, a five-star review, pretty please, on whatever app you're on. Or you can follow me on the socialmedia.com. Confessions of the Idiots on Instagram and Facebook. Mr. Sammy P on Twitter.com. And my personal Instagram, Sam Peterson 91 Please do support the wonderful Will Anderson as well, who is my guest on the special bonus episode for this week. Support Will in everything he does because he is extremely supportive of everyone in the comedy community. Anyway, back to the show. So confession two comes from Leah. Leah writes, you're only as good as the world you live in. My grandmother told me that the day before she died. 
Isn't that good? Final last words, Will. What would, have you got any famous last words? Because, I mean, that's pretty... It doesn't really make sense out of context no. what the grandmother said. But have you got famous famous last words? Is there anything that you think you would want to say before, you know, before... I'll just say it before you die, Will. We all die at some point. Okay, so firstly... Um, I, I I hope that I have time to think about it. That would be yeah. good. Because yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. so much stupid stuff all the time that if I die mid-sentence, <laughs> yeah. that like it's more likely to not be something profound at all. I'd be like, yeah. it'd just be like, you know, of all the Batman I would have sex with in order, I think that Val Kilmer has... like, And you'd be like, dead. Yeah. What was his famous yeah. life? Well, he was talking about... I believe he was talking about having sex with Val Kilmer as Batman. <laughs> I think that was his... He usually was. Yeah. In his old in his old age. In yeah, the that um, in, <laughs> Yeah, that does not surprise me at all. There, it's really funny about famous last words as well because there are a long list of people who have had famous last words. You know, writers like Oscar Wilde right. and people like that. And I do wonder if they were actually their last words or just the last words recorded because you can't imagine them ever being their famous last words. Well, like, particularly there was a, if the, like, the doctor came into me, I'm laying in bed, yeah. you know, and he's like, yeah, you're probably going to die in the next couple of hours. If you've got anything else to say, say it. And I'm yeah. like lying there and I'm like, you know, Either these curtains go or I do, you know. <laughs> and then I've I've nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> You're just waiting. And then I'm just closing my eyes and <laughs> shutting the fuck up. Like my For fam- hours. My family have come in. They're just like, we love you. Just please say I love you one more time. And you're like, okay, I love you, Tommy. Either these curtains go or I do. Okay. <laughs> Like, so after everything, you just start repeating your final words. You're like, I'm thirsty. Can I have some orange juice? Either these curtains go or I do. Just waiting. Or just as soon as people start leaving the room, you have to say it again because you just said something else to the nurse. You're like, quick, come back in. (laughs) That would be amazing. Janet, can you empty my IV bag? Either these curtains go or I do. I go, I had no idea what he said. I have no idea what his last words were. Well, this was the grandmother's last words before. Okay, so before she dies, she says what? Repeat it again. (laughs) You're only as good as the world you live in. Mm, Pretty easy for someone who's about to not be living in that world (laughs) to say that, wasn't it? I'm out. Tap out. I'm out. I'm done. Nan's out. It stuck with me all that time. Not only because I love the saying... But when she carked it, I knew that she had left the world in a better place than she found it in. So that's that's quite now. That's reading into what Nan said. I don't think Nan really meant that, but I think she's reading into it in a nice way. Also, that's quite nice. I mean, it possibly is overstating Nan's contribution to the world. Sure. She just loved the TAB. I reckon Nan just loved the TAB. Nan might have kept her own world, like made her own world better than she found it, but. What was Nan doing about climate change? Let's like, be honest, I want it to didn't affect me well. Was, was Nan contributing to the IPCC you know, statement on climate change? Because there's some bigger issues than maybe yeah. just cooking cookies for the local church group on a Sunday, Nan. <laughs> never affected me. It never affected me. I'll safely say that. She was a good woman. And without going into too much detail here, I loved her. Oh. That's, again, <laughs> such a weird thing to weird. say without going into too much detail about yeah. because <laughs> Just to say you love someone. Because it In what way? Makes it sound sus. Yeah, it, like does, it, it goes, does make it sound sus. Without going sus. into too much detail, I loved her a lot, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> I do a little wink after yeah. it as well. It always makes things better. Uh, it, it's also weird that she said carked it as well. You don't hear that much about a loved one. No. They say they carked it. It's usually Everything someone else you don't know. Everything else has so beautiful. And then she carked it. <laughs> then she carked it. <laughs> I have always felt like I needed to leave the world in a better place too. Yeah. There was a large part of me that needed to do Nan proud. Mm. That's nice. That she loved nice. it, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that, absolutely. I, that I, I nice. love that. Live your yeah, life. that's nice. As a legacy and dedication and appreciate, you know, people who've come before yeah. you. That's all, This is all good it's stuff. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know it's not going to end like this, Will, but um, I, I mean... <laughs> yeah, sure. I've heard the podcast. Why I brought you on the podcast, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've, <laughs> I've done something that I find hard to explain. Oh. My good girlfriend, Naomi, and I had been friends for years. Mm. Now, Will, all this Nan stuff up top didn't need it. Right. Let's just say that. Unnecessary like, preamble. It's, it's, 
It's unnecessary preamble. Not connected to the major body of the confession. Is that what we're saying? <laughs> That's what we're saying. Yeah. I think I should call this podcast unnecessary preamble. I think I should retitle it. <laughs> okay, so she says, my good friend Naomi and I have been friends for years. We met in university and just clicked. You know when you meet someone and you just get them? Yeah. Yeah. It was always like that with us. Clickety clickers. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not a term that people it's use. Not a term. <laughs> you know us, Will. Clickety clickers. Clickety clickers. <laughs> yeah, when I first met you, Will, I was like, oh, we're clickety clickers. Yeah. We're all clickety clickers. <laughs> yeah, Will, Will Anderson and I. Yeah, clickety clickers. <laughs> ah, big clickety clickers. You know that? Clickety clickers. Ha. Huh. That's what they should have called us. Oh, but they yeah. didn't. But they didn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't. They they, did no, not. they didn't, mate. Sorry no. about that. They, that's what they should have called us. Naomi and I were going to live together a year ago, but a better offer came up. Mm-hmm. All right. So, Will, like in, in your experience, if you, you know, if you're living in a share house, you're going to go and live with your best friend, you know, because you're clickety clickers. That's what they should have called you. You and your mate, you're going to move in together and then a better offer comes up. What do you do in a situation like that, Will, well, with your clickety clicker? I mean, here's the thing. It's got to be a much better offer. It really does. This is yeah. my clickety clicker. Clickety clicker. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah, sorry, you're clickety clicker. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to just abandon my clickety clicker for some... <laughs> random offer this is going to be right. either someone who's even bigger clickety clicker with me than the original clickety clicker or at least a better room in a better location <laughs> at the very least <laughs> one of the two yeah, one of the two i had a much cooler friend and naomi and i had been searching houses together i would promised naomi that we would live together but then when harriet asked mm. Harriet hasn't come up before. This is a new, this is a, we've heard about the fucking Nan and we've heard about her clickety click, but Harriet's a new character. Harriet asked, I knew that she'd be having so many more parties and living a much funner life. Oh. So clickety click are not as exciting. No, that's, bit, that's bit, bit why boring. they, this is what I'm hearing, that this person yeah. is also not that exciting. And the reason yeah. that they've clicked, you know, yeah. with Naomi is that they're both, they can be not exciting together. That's what's. Yeah. That's what they've bonded over, but clickety suddenly click. she has an, an opportunity. I could live in this house with my clickety clicker, yeah. but we're yeah. going to have a pretty boring, mundane life. Or I can go yeah. and like, you know what Harriet's like? Parties all night, Harriet. The boisterous life. Exactly. Fucking lit, well. <laughs> Fucking lit, as the French would say. <laughs> as the French would say. I'm sorry, I just slipped into French again. <laughs> uh, I was the one who was the contact on all the rental properties we applied mm. for. I told her that we didn't get any, but we did. We had three offers the entire time, but I already moved in with Harriet and was pretending I lived at home. And I've been doing that for a year now. She moved in with her cousin and hates it. Who wouldn't? (laughs) I don't know. We don't know the cousin, mate. I mean, firstly, (laughs) I mean, we're going to have to get back to a year. Like a year year felt like a big number that came out of nowhere. I'm like... I've been doing this for a year now. Was like, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. what is going on? Just you have been What's living a double that? life that is no way yeah. worth, like you know, the harm that you're doing to yourself in this situation. Absolutely but, not. No, you're absolutely right. Let's go back to the cousin. What was the who would cousin who wouldn't who wouldn't? <laughs> yeah, hated it. Uh, living with. I live at home, and I've been doing that for a year now. She moved in with her cousin and hates it. Who wouldn't? And I pretend to live with my parents. Okay, so, all right. Okay, this is just, this is a tangled web now. Firstly, why do you hate your cousins? What would your grandmother think about that? Like, you know, surely (laughs) love for the whole family. Yeah, love first. Love always wins. Is it a universal truth that people hate living with their cousins? I don't think so. It's not something that I widely know. No. Like I'm not. I'm not walking around going. Someone go. I'm moving with my cousin. Oh, you'd hate that. that. I'm so sorry. Oh, nah, not worst. for me. Icky. No thanks. Someone who's vaguely related to you. Oh no. Terribly. Oh, no. Similar age. No oh, thanks. Oh god. Gross. They got a good job in the city. No thanks. Yeah. Grew up in families nearby, but didn't spend that much time together that you hate each other. Oh, the worst. <laughs> Yeah, like so the, the 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 cousin hate doesn't go into that. It's just hates her cousin for some Unnecessary. reason. So Unnecessary. So the year of her living this debaucherous party life with Harriet, yeah. but pretending yeah. she's still living at home with her parents. Now, yeah. this is now a double life because if like Harriet's yeah. partying all the time, like how are yeah. you even enjoying the parties? 
Because aren't you constantly worried? Or does Harriet have such a separate social group? She has to. Because, because you know, you think about Instagram, you think about all right? these things now as well, like Snapchat, you know, that's all I know. I, I pretended I had a huge list. I don't. But, you know, all of those things that would expose someone like that. Well, you know, I, this has got to be like, it's got to be like when a celebrity is at a strip club or something like that and somebody takes a photo and then a minder comes over and like gets the person's phone and erases the photo. I assume that she's had to set up an elaborate system. So she's yeah. at these parties could never enjoy the parties because she's constantly yeah. paranoid about somebody Just posting stressed. on social media that she was at this party. What, a, what an awful life. Like to do that for a year only because Harriet's a little bit more fun. And, also, and she could go to the party still. I'm sure she's still invited if she's living with her clickety-click. I'm sure she's still invited to the party. Well, this is the other thing. You have not been inviting your clickety-click to Harriet's parties. You've yeah, been partying yeah. with Harriet at her place now for a year. This is much worse. Yeah. Like if you just said at the start you're moving in with Harriet, but hey, guess what the good news is, clickety-clicker? <laughs> you can live with your cousin who's rad. Yeah. So firstly, yeah. that's a win. <laughs> Probably She's better awesome. than living with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to be living at Harriet's place. And she has parties all the time. And you are my clickety-clicker. So you know what's going to happen yeah. at those parties? You're also going to come to those parties. And we're going to go to some yeah. mad parties. Yeah, yeah. Have sleepovers it's, it's, in my room, party all night. It's going to be the best. Yeah. It's also like for someone who lives in that house, it's like it's, it's not always the best thing to be living in the house where the parties are always happening. It's true. Like that's kind of always the worst when you've got a few stragglers. <laughs> They're still there in the morning and they're always there. And there's probably a guy called Rick, I imagine. There's just always people also, just hanging out. what world do you imagine that you're living in where Harriet is happy to live with you, but she wouldn't invite you to the parties? You could have just <laughs> moved in with Naomi and just said so to Harriet, easier. when you're having parties, please invite me. Invite I'd love me. To come. I'd love to come. <laughs> I'd love to come. Thank you. This is how she ends it. She says, <laughs> I have to be careful not to slip up. But I always go to hers because I say I don't want to hang out at mum's. Mm. It's been a year. I should probably tell her. This is how this is how it ends. This is the last sentence. My nan would be ashamed. So she brings it back to the nan, which is quite nice. Book ending it with that, even though it wasn't needed. Do you think her nan would be ashamed, Will, <laughs> of what Lee has done? I mean, I think she would, actually. Yeah, yeah. This is not leaving the world better than you found it. No. and Not at all. You've taken your, your clickety-clicker and at the first opportunity for social advancement, you have not only lied to, but burdened her with the heavy burden of living with her cousin. Like, I mean, <laughs> the worst. You, you've ruined Nothing her life. Worse. You've yeah. destroyed this other woman. That's what you've done and your nana would be rolling over in her grave. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you've let your nan down. Mm. You've hurt your clickety-clicker. They can't come back. Is there a way, Will, after a year of doing that, that you can come clean and say... This is what I've done. I'm actually living with Harry. I mean, ease of mind, but would, would that? Do you think that would ruin the clickety click? Well, otherwise, you've got to maintain this friendship for the rest of your existence, pretending that you live at home with your parents <laughs> when you're living with Harriet. It is a bit yeah. being lied to over that period of time is worse than the initial lie. Yeah, yeah, and also the web of lies that you have after that as well. I mean. Like, because even if you move back in with your parents, at some stage it's going to come up if she was over at your parents' house. Because clearly the parents aren't in on the plan. You know? <laughs> no. So she's they haven't been telling briefed. Naomi that she's living with her parents, but she hasn't told her parents that she's told Naomi that. Because you know why? They'd be like, your nan would be disgusted with you. <laughs> What's your nan saying? Yeah. What's your nan saying? What's your nan saying? You're not only as good as the world you live in. <laughs> it's widely known in that family that that's the saying and you live by that. Whatever that means. You remember her last words? Oh, shit. No, the ones we say were her last words. The thing about the world and leaving it better. Remember, we, we all agreed. tell everybody they were her last words. We all agreed it wouldn't be our shit. <laughs> so, Will, after all of that, can you? do you think there's a point where you can come clean and just say, hey, I, I fucked up, I did this, or do you think that you just need to... Move on and and never bring it up again. If you end up moving out with, actually you start moving out with Naomi, like living with Naomi at some point, do you think you can just leave it? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to ruin the clickety-click. I mean, I think that, yeah. I mean, by your actions, you have condemned your friendship. Mm -hmm. It is hard to see, unless Naomi is incredibly forgiving. 
it is hard to see it making a strong comeback from the scenario <laughs> you have painted yourself into. It yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There does not seem to be much of a win here. But I all, here's what I will say. Is lying for one year is really bad and would be really hurtful for your friend to find out about. Lying for 10 years is heaps worse. So, so if you just want to look it's up at to it you, like mate. that. She might forgive one year, but maybe not 10. Maybe not 20. When Harriet's like in 20 years when they run into her and go, remember when we used to live together? Well, well, yeah, I was going to say, or like, yeah, poor Naomi's on her deathbed. <laughs> she just comes up and whispers, I'm living with Harriet. <laughs> Famous last words. <laughs> We've got the next confession that comes from Dave. Dave types, I've been, st- I've been storing my piss in bottles mm. for a long time. Mm-hmm. I started doing it because I wanted to. That's a pretty good reason, don't you think? <laughs> I, had a, I had lost a bet with a friend of mine mm. and he said that I had to piss in bottles for a week. Well, hang on. That, that doesn't seem like you wanted to at all. You lost a bet. Or you lost a bet. did you already want to piss in bottles? And so you've got yourself into a convoluted bet with your friend where you're like, oh, yeah? Well, if I oh. can't do that, I'm going to piss in a bottle every day for a week. How about that? Like, you're like, Scott Morrison's going to be yeah. the next president of the United States. Yeah. Bet me. Bet, bet me. me. <laughs> or I will piss in a bottle every day, something I will definitely hate. <laughs> I'd lost a bet with a friend of mine and he said that I had to piss in bottles for weeks. I did. Then he told me I had to do it for way longer. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how that bet holds up that you say you're going to do it for a few weeks and then you go, but now you have to do it for way longer. I mean, it's not like there's another bet. It's like now you just have to do it for way longer. Just an extension. Like it, just this, an extension this of real, the bet. This really already feels like a dom and sub relationship. This is <laughs> what is going on here. Yeah. <laughs> I did, but then he told me I had to do it for way longer. So now I've been doing it for weeks. The rule is I can't go to the toilet. So I've been getting up and doing it in an empty bottle. I don't want my mom or anything to know. So I'm very careful that I put the bottle in the fridge with a big label that says, do not touch. Sam, how is this a plan of any kind? <laughs> how is this? This is like like the opening scene of the jackass reboot this is not a plan to cover it up like yeah. you it's it's already covered up no one knows it's yeah. there wherever it is and you yeah. can take the bottle and put it down like a sink or like a plug hole or down the toilet just pour it there are so many options like so many <laughs> most of them probably on your way to the kitchen unless your room is right next to the kitchen you probably have to walk past a sink yep. or a bathroom or some sort of yep. opportunity to dispose of the urine well sure. before you're labeling it. Cause like, do what? Do you also have a labeling machine in your bedroom? He bought oh, one. <laughs> just like, I've doing a few more weeks. I'll have to invest. And then putting it in the fridge. In the fridge of all places. You could put that anywhere. It could literally be anywhere else. It could be outside. Maybe the one place that makes it look in any way appetizing to another human being. Cause <laughs> yeah. if you, Saw that bottle of warm liquid anywhere else, yeah. your immediate thought wouldn't be, oh, I'm parched. I'm going to have a little sip of this. But if it's in the fridge, like yeah. almost the idea of it being in the fridge, at any, like apart from checking maybe like, you know, when something might, you know, go off, like you could randomly go to most people's fridge and be confident that if you opened it up, you could consume most of the stuff that's in there. That's kind of the idea of the fridge. So you've literally put it in a place that most lures people into consuming it. Sure. You sure. want most this to look happen in the fridge is what I'm food. saying. Yeah. All I'm saying <laughs> is you want this to happen. He says, I like, I made that very clear that nobody should be touching it. Mm. But the other day I came home and it was empty. I asked my mom and she said that my dad had been helping himself to the bottle. I confronted him about it and he said that if I'm living at home at the age of 26, so 26 will and he's still having his... <laughs> His bets extended by his friend pissing in a bottle. 